keynote speaker, Colonel Rob Dunham. He's one of your neighbors. His daughter attended this school. Uh, and uh, while you look along the line here, for the most part, those of us are here, we're telling you about our past experiences. I'd like, Colonel Dunham is going to tell you about your friends and neighbors who are serving daily to keep you safe. Colonel Dunham. Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for having me come out here. Um, Veterans Day is, is a very, very important day. The history of Veterans Day, it used to be called Armistice Day. The 11th day, the 11th month at the 11th hour is when World War I ended. Uh, my own personal story with that is my grandfather was in World War I, and he was engaged in one of the battles that stopped at the 11th hour. He was shot at 20 minutes before the end of World War I. But that's where it started. It originally was called Armistice Day. Then in the 1930s changed to become Veterans Day and be for all veterans. I want to thank all the veterans who came out here to talk to you and to, uh, to relay their stories. I think it's vitally important that you hear their stories and you relay, relate the history that you're learning in school, the history that's all around you, to personal experiences. The beauty of America is these are all your friends and neighbors and relatives. We are not designed to have a small professional military that does everything. We are designed to have involvement throughout. Now, when the draft went away in the 70s, that changed. But we still have some of that with the Guard and Reserve. I'm a reservist. I have another full-time job, but I also serve. I'm currently doing full-time service in the military. I'm taking a leave from my, uh, my job. But I'm going to tell you the story that <clears throat> your friends and neighbors are the ones that are out there doing the, the nation's work as we speak. This is the second time I've got up today to stand in front of a group. The first group I stood in front of, they were on their way out to an airplane to head out to the desert where they're about to deploy um, for ongoing operations against ISIS. <clears throat> this stuff doesn't end, it's going on as we speak. All of them have another civilian job. They all are taking time off from that to do their nation's work. It's a remarkable thing. So I, I would ask you to stay in touch with that and consider it. And I'm going to get back to that in a little bit. But first, I want to go back to thanking this group. These folks who came, out he, who came out here and relayed their stories today, they've all been part of some tremendous things. We've got stories going back to World War II, Vietnam, Korea, um, and then more recently with um, <clears throat> the operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. It really is tremendous. Now, all of you now, <laughs> think that what happened last week was a long time ago. There will come a point when you're as old as I am, and time doesn't work that way. So to my mind, 9-11 was very recent. I know to most of you, 9-11 was something happened when you were very, very young. Um, going back to when I was in high school, Vietnam seemed like ancient history. Now, no, not so much. Um, and it, it's remarkable to me that Vietnam was more recent to my high school experience than 9-11 is to you. Yet 9-11 defines so much of what's going on in the world today while we put up with lines at the airports and things like that. Which gets to, in addition to thanking all these folks, my second point that I want to get to with you guys. And that is <clears throat> that history is still happening. History is not something that happened a long time ago that you kind of learn about and yeah, isn't that sort of neat and you move on. Um, no, history is going on as we speak, and it's very, very important that you're aware of what happened before to inform what happens next, and you realize that it's going on. You don't know what day is going to be a big day that changes your life, or what day is going to be that big day that changes everybody's life. On that morning of 9-11, going back to my theme with the reserves, um, <clears throat> it was a Tuesday. Tuesday mornings, we used to, at McGuire Air Force Base, every Tuesday morning, two KC-10s would take off, load it up, each with 250,000 pounds of fuel, and they were just going to do a training mission because it's difficult to refuel when you're that heavy. And so they were going to do practice heavyweight refueling. Takeoff time was 9 o'clock in the morning. What time did the towers get hit? 9 o'clock in the morning. So they took off, nobody knew what had happened, and all of a sudden, the <clears throat> NORAD is wondering, oh my God, can we get tankers in the air? because we don't know what's happened, we just know we're under attack. 
And I'll be darned if a bunch of citizen soldiers who just thought that they were going to go out and have fun on my part-time job where I get to fly a little bit and just do that for the day, all of a sudden were involved in the first combat actions in the post-9-11 era. It's remarkable. You never know what day that's going to happen. So be aware of it. Be in tune to it. The third thing is where I think it's a gift that these folks came out and talked to you today <coughs> is you need to be informed. You need to understand. You need context. History is not a bunch of dates in a book. History is much more involved than that. It's remarkable the things that are going on today with the fight against ISIS, how much of that relates to decisions that were made at the end of World War I. Wow. That was a long time ago. Why does it make a difference now? Well, that's where it's important that you guys understand that. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson made the point that a nation that expects to be ignorant and free expects that which never was and never will be. We can't be free if we have an ignorant populace. And it's so important that you, as high school students, are absorbing all of you can so that you can so that you are informed citizens going forward. Why do we have a public education system in this country? It's not to prepare you all to get jobs, although that's what most of you think. It's not to prepare you all to go to college, though that's what most of you think. The reason it's a public education is the government thinks it's important that we have an informed citizenry to be good citizens going forward. And that's the number one thing that we have public schools for. And things like this are an important part of preparing you for that, for being citizens going forward. So I certainly hope that you got the chance to hear some remarkable stories about things these people did. I certainly hope that it helped to inform some of your thinking about what's going on in the world today. I hope that some of you start thinking about things like, OK, so Al-Qaeda and ISIS are both Sunni extremists. What's the difference? One claims to be a caliphate. What difference does that make? Does it make a difference in how we should interact with them? Because it certainly does. And those types of things are what informs the public going forward. Right now, our defense budget is bigger than most of the rest of the defense budgets around the world. Is that the position we want to be in? Is it not the position we want to be in? <clears throat> it's easy to sit back and just stop your knowledge right there and make a decision on the surface, but that doesn't get to where you need to be to be an informed citizenry that makes smart decisions, that picks the right leaders. So that's where I want you to go, and that's where programs like this are vitally important. Now, all of these folks who told you the and I hope they told you really good stories, and I hope you asked great questions, and I hope you continue to have good questions. Um, they've done remarkable things and continue to do remarkable things. These are incredible Americans. So your job going forward is to be the next generation of incredible Americans. <clears throat> there is no better feeling than being part of something bigger. Shawnee High School has won back-to-back -back state football championships. That's awesome. I guarantee everybody on the team you get a great feeling from being part of that something bigger. Service, as you get to be an adult, is the same type of thing. It doesn't have to be military service. It can be volunteer service, all kinds of service. But I ask you to please consider some portion of your life being dedicated to service going forward. <clears throat> I mentioned again, I'm going to go back to being the reserve. Um, the reserve and the guard are your friends, neighbors, relatives. These are people who have full-time jobs out in the, the real world and also do military service on the side. If you think you've got any interest at all in military service, I would tell you that there's all kinds of options out there in the active component that do phenomenal things, and we need good people doing that. And the fact is, we turn down a lot of people because they're not good enough, and that's great. But the reserve has even more. And these are folks who do it on a part-time basis, and it's a way to continue service going forward. So I would ask you to please consider it. Now to wrap up, because I know it's the end of the day and everybody wants to get out of here, um, <coughs> we're going to take a, an opportunity here to, uh, again, go down the line, introduce folks, and get another uh, shot to hear what everybody's story. But just to sum up again, I want to once again do thank you to all of these folks who've done phenomenal things to make America what it is today. And I want to thank all the future veterans out there in the audience, because I know some of you are going to be. And at some point, you're going to be getting your free appetizer at Applebee's on, the, uh, on Veterans Day as well.
Thank you, sir. At, at this point, we're going to pass the mic down one to, on one for a brief name and your uh, background or a statement. Hello, I'm Colonel Mark Preston. I'm supposed to be brief. I graduated Shawnee in 1981. I was here in 1977. 1977 when Mr. Gushu just started, so just to give you an idea how young I am. Um, I'm a veteran of Bosnia, Operation Joint Ford, and Iraq, and Shawnee was good to me. Thank you. My name is Jim Bry. It's been 30 plus years since I was in this room. I was president of the band parents. My uh, daughter was a lacrosse player. My son played in a band. It's a uh, nice welcome home to me. I was in the military, in the Marine Corps, 1964 to 84, also in the National Guard. And I have to pick up on what the Colonel had said. You don't have to be a full-timer like me and love the Marine Corps. You can do it part-time. Just support your country. As I told some of the classes that I was in today, the country's going down the tubes. It needs you. It needs you now. It needs you in the future. Support your country. You don't have to support the Marine Corps. It's your country that you need to support. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Gilbert. I am a Vietnam veteran and damn proud of it. I went into the Army. I went in, I graduated high school in 1969. I went into the Army September of 69. I got out in 1976. I was in Vietnam, Da Nang, 1970 to 71. The military is not for everybody. That's something that you have to choose yourself. But there's a lot of availability of school that you can get in the military. And it's something that I think that every individual has to decide for themselves whether or not they want to put on the uniform, whether it be Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard. It doesn't make a difference. If you think that you want to serve your country, don't be afraid to do it. And if you see a vet, don't be afraid to shake his hand and thank him. He will not bite you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Kurt Anderson. I graduated high school in 1971. I was 17. I enlisted in the United States Navy. I just want to end this by saying that our Navy still rules the seas. My name is Harry Garby. Back in the last century, I sat in seats just like you sit out there in the auditorium. War was declared December 7, 41. Everybody I knew, my brother, my relatives, many of my friends, all joined the service. So did I, as a kid. Not knowing any different, but I did. Looking back, it was stupid, but I did. I served in Iwo Jima. Survived it. You've all seen the flag raising monuments and so forth. I was there. I saw that. I didn't see the second flag raising, the famous picture that Joe Rosenthal took, because it was up and down, this real quick switch. The day the war ended, I was about to load a ship to invade Japan. We were going to invade right about this time of the year, 70 years ago. When they came to me, we were taking tent down tents because we were never going back to Maui again after Japan. Hopefully, we would win it at that point. So I just said, put some, back, put some tents back up again. Typical Marine Corps, take them down, put them up. One of us said, so what is this, a game? The war's over. I am smiling now, and I smiled then. That was the happiest day of my life. 
came home, GI Bill, went to college, became a gym teacher, joined the state police. And now I tell recruits when they graduate, and we're invited back at every graduation, they tell us, tell the recruits a story about your first days on the road as a young trooper. And also I tell them a little story about your first days as an instructor, and as your first days as an academy commandant. I do, I tell them all those stories. And I wind up telling them, as I look at them, they're all young, eager men and women who become future troopers, all beautiful, handsome people. I tell them, now you were all a lot smarter than I was back in my day. You're much more smart. I'll give you one bit of advice, and I'll give you that same advice, since you're all smart, and you are. Don't do anything stupid. <laughs> Amen. My name is Dan Falzone. I joined the United States Marine Corps because my father was in the Marine Corps in World War II. I was in the United States Marine Corps from September 30th, 1983 to January 28th, 1986. And all I have to say is simplify, go renegades. My name is Pete Glennon I'm from Tabernacle. It's in the United States Air Force, also a Vietnam vet, and damn proud of it also. Did two tours in Southeast Asia both in uh, Thailand and flying bombing missions out of there into Vietnam, supporting the war effort. Again, I would do it in a minute. George Almer, in the United States Army, 1958 to 1960, served one year over in Korea. And I might say, I feel honored to be amongst this great bunch of veterans up here. And in the words of John F. Kennedy, it's not what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. My name is Cliff Toy. I live in Tabernacle. I grew up in Camden. I graduated high school in 66, and then I was drafted in 68 to become a, well, I wound up being a door gunner in a light observation helicopter in Vietnam for about a year, and a couple points. One is, I remember my sixth grade teacher, she was crazy for current events, and I couldn't be bothered. I didn't want to hear about it. She spoke endlessly about French Indochina. Guess what? French Indochina became Vietnam. Turned out to be pretty important to me and a bunch of my friends. She also talked about Iraq and Iran, Persia. Couldn't be bothered. Guess what? That's important, more, maybe, more so maybe than Vietnam has been or was. The last thing is, every person up on this stage wrote a, a blank check to, the, to our country that was payable up to and including their life. That's a big deal, folks. Remember that. And learn what you can about history. Thank you. Uh, my name's Roy Plummer. I grew up in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I graduated from high school in uh, 1962 and went off to college at uh, Penn State University. And at the time, because we still had the selective service, or what we more commonly know as the draft, uh, Penn State, as a state institution, had a mandatory ROTC program, which I stayed with for my four years and, and finished college as a uh, commissioned second lieutenant, and was uh, more fortunate, I guess, than most of the gentlemen on the stage here in that I got to use my degree in the military at least for the first year. I actually worked as an industrial engineer, which was my degree, um, uh, out of Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, and uh, then got orders to uh, get shipped off to uh, Korea, even though it was during the Vietnam War era. Um, there was an incident that happened in Korea where the North uh, Koreans captured a U.S. Uh, spy ship, the USS Pueblo, and that changed my orders very uh, quickly, 
and I found myself in Korea serving over there for a year with the Korean Military Advisory Group. And that was pretty much my career. I went on, uh, uh, my military career, I went on to a career in engineering and later human resources. And although I never forced it, uh, uh, or it was an issue with my children, but all three of them, two of them are in the uh, military. I have a daughter and son-in-law uh, that are lieutenant commanders in the Navy, a son who's a tech sergeant uh, in the Air Force, and another son who uh, works for uh, Lockheed Martin, which is where I finished out my career. Uh, uh, so I'm very proud of not only my service, but the fact that they're giving back to this great country of ours also. Thank you. My name is Major Ron Hathaway. United States Marine Corps retired. 33 years, four months, 16 days. I just want to say that during my time in the Corps, I served in the Bear Pigs, Cuban Crisis, Grenada, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf. I am 73 years old, and I survived. And the Marine Corps has a saying, Semper Fidelis. That means always faithful. I will always be faithful to you because all these men up here have fought for you to have the freedom and the liberty to do as you please and to get an education. So with that, I say thank you for having us and Semper Fidelis. Thank you, Ron. My name is Don Smyzik. I served in the Marine Corps from 1966 to 68, 18 months Naval Hospital. I want to thank the principal, all the students. You've been great. I look forward to coming back to you again. One thing I want you to remember, one thing, when you go home, tell your parents or grandparents thank you for your service that they serve because it means a lot to them. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Sergeant Francis Redker. I'm a Shawnee grad, year 2000, um, Iraq War veteran. I just wanted to tell you, um, like anything in, in uh, agriculture, if you plant something, you need to water it for it to grow. Uh, for me, in high school, I worked on a farm, and I had the uh, real pleasure of working with a gentleman while we actually farmed his land. His name was Benny, and the United States military saved him from Auschwitz. And he used to tell me about how his life changed the day the U.S. military stormed that fence, and everybody got to continue living their life. No one in my family ever served in the military. I was the first. And I'll just tell you, events like this, uh, Mr. D actually had these years wrong. You guys used to do this when I was in high school, so that's more than 12 years ago. Um, that watered it for me. And uh, hearing stories like this will water the seeds that are planted for you guys. So um, just remember, we have a fantastic country. And uh, God bless America. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Bob Licato. I'm Spec 4 United States Army. I was drafted in 1968, served until 1970. I was in Vietnam in 1969, and I want to say Semper Fi to my Marine friends up here. Welcome home to my Vietnam buddies here, and also uh, want to say to all the other veterans, thank you for your service. Uh, we as veterans are proud to be of service to our great country, and um, I myself too in am included in that regard. Um, I wear these beads here in great honor. One is for the POW, and one is for the flag of Vietnam. We all wore these dog tags, and uh, my dad was in the World War II. I was drafted in the Army in the Vietnam era. My brother was in the Air Force. My other brother was in the Marines. I know, and I say oorah to the Army. So my mom had one more son. She wanted him to join the Navy, so she would have had everybody in all the service. But however, my youngest brother never went into the Navy. He was the best swimmer anyway. But uh, thank you for having me here today. And I, I love coming here, and I will come here every year
you just, you just hang with me. I want to tell you something about this great man. The first time I met Howard Brooks, he introduced himself at, at our meeting, the, uh, the, the Armed Forces Heritage Museum meeting. He got up and he said, hi, I'm Howard Brooks and I served in the South Pacific. And then he sat down. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me tell you about Howard Brooks. Howard Brooks, was a electrician's mate third class aboard the cruiser Houston right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. When the nation went to war, his ship was in Manila. They departed immediately and they ran back and forth between Australia and supplying the troops in the South Pacific. In April of 1942, his ship was trying to get back to Darwin, Australia, when they ran into a convoy, a huge Japanese flotilla. And his ship and the Australian cruiser Perth were both sunk. 1,200 people were on that ship. Less than 350 got off alive. Howard was in the water for three days, clinging onto a life raft as he pulled wounded people and put them on the raft while he stayed in the water. As the people died, the Japanese came up and they looked at the raft and he hung on the side so they couldn't see him. He drifted ashore. They encountered the, uh, the natives. The natives said they would, he would, he, they would take him to the Dutch. They took him to the Japanese and got paid for turning him in. He was sent to Burma where he worked as a slave laborer for three and a half years. He took a beating almost every day. When the, war came, when the railroad was finished, he was sent to Saigon. That's where he was when the war ended. He came home, he served in the Navy, he advanced to warrant officer fourth he then left the Navy, got a degree in electrical engineering, and served, and serves not the right word. He performed in that role until he retired. This is a truly great patriot and a great American. I was born in, uh, 19 and 19, Woodrow Wilson had just returned from Marseille, signing the World War I Treaty. 20 years later, I joined the Navy in September 39. Hitler had just marched into Poland. Three months later, I was on a ship on my way to Manila the Asiatic fleet. That was two years before Pearl Harbor. After that, I think Bob told you the rest of my World War II career. <laughs> the rest, you got the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. That is the rest of the story. <laughs>